Welcome back to Morbidly Bewitched. This is the final of the Everest trilogy. Stay tuned. please subscribe and um, if you like podcasts I have the same uh, going morbidly bewitched under Spotify, Amazon, Stitcher, all those sorts. In the death zone of Everest. So this is Everest isn't she pretty? So pleased. Uh, you have what's known as the death zone and the death zone is anything above 26,000 feet. So the death zone is roughly about, oh, didn't realise this doesn't, uh, this is my little line, my death zone line. So anything from here up is the death zone. Along the north ridge, which is along here, between step three and four of the final stretch of the summit is Green Boots Cave. This is where a mountaineer uh, climbed in, believed to have climbed in in 1996 to seek refuge and he died there curled up in the same position with his bright green boots sticking out of the cave. On the 14th of May 2006 a group of climbers heading for the summit looked into Green Boots Cave and were quite shocked because they noticed that he had a little friend. The man was huddled in beside Green Boots and considered more dead than alive. Almost 40 people walked past him that night. And to an awful lot, they think it's an absolute disgrace that some kind of rescue mission should have been organized, but it's not that simple. Above 26,000 feet, remember, anything above here, the body starts to eat itself. The brain can swell, the lungs can swell, and you can suffer from hypothermia, and snow blindness, and even heart failure. So to try and help somebody within this zone, they have to at least be conscious, or speaking, or be able to move. And this man could do neither. He was frozen solid in a, almost a fetal position with his knees up and his arms resting on his knees. The exploitation for the bid to summit Everest has been commercialized. To do it right, you can spend anything from or up to 50,000 pounds, but you can do it on a budget. Now, I think the cheapest you can get to go to Everest is about 6,000 pounds, and that basically gets you your permit a yak to carry all of your stuff up the mountain and food at base camp, but little else. One man who opted for this cheaper option was David Sharp. He spent the lowest amount of money you could with a company called Asian Trekking to get him and some of his equipment to base camp and that was it. But critically, David did not have a radio or communications and he was one of those adrenaline junkies who wanted to summit Everest without supplementary oxygen. Something that can be done but it is ill-advised and considered extremely dangerous. David's friends back home would have joked with him about being a rocket scientist because he actually was one. And he wanted to step away from that though and pursue a career in teaching. On the 13th of May, one of the climbers from the larger groups was taking pictures of the summit when he noticed something in the images. 
a man. He looked like he was still trying to ascend the mountain late into the afternoon on his own. Late afternoon for a bid to summit is also ill-advised because you are supposed to at least reach the summit at 2pm so that your descent, the most dangerous part of the mission, is during daylight hours. Summit day for the larger groups was May 14th. So half an hour before midnight on the 13th, they were geared up prepping themselves for the summit from Camp 4, the last stretch, for 12 hours in the death zone. They start at their hike, five steps forward rest, five steps forward rest. It is an exhausting, grueling sensation on the mind and the body, which is extremely hard to overcome, but you must not stop. That is just, Sherpas are behind people all the time saying, keep moving, keep moving, because you need to stay warm and focused. It would have been about one o'clock in the morning of the 14th when they came across Green Boots Cave. Now, Green Boots Cave is extremely exposed. On the left is a sheer drop down the Kang Chung face, and on your right is a sheer drop down the entire north face of the mountain, both over 2,000 foot of a drop. One wrong step or movement and you will take what mountaineers call the Grand Tower, the whole way down. They seen this poor frost-stricken man curled in beside Green Boots and realised then that's the man that I seen trying to summit on his own late into the afternoon. He was barely moving, but you could tell he was still alive by the smallest of movements as he breathed. People started shouting at him, get moving, just keep moving, get yourself out and move down the mountain. You will be able to follow the headlights from the traffic source down to camp four. You need to get moving. But there was no response and they had no option but to move on. The team made the coveted summit and after a few elated snapshots they started to make their way back down. Very soon into this descent that they realised they would probably come across this guy again in Green Boots Cave and about nine hours later they did and he had not moved but he was still alive. By this time it was daylight so they started radioing down to their base camp saying that there's this guy here and that he he's in a terrible state what are we to do? So base camp started throwing all of the standard questions at the team. Is he moving? Is he talking? Can he walk? Is he communicating in any way? All of the above answers were no. So they were advised to leave him. Two extremely strong Sherpas were sent to try and help the stricken man. They pulled him out of the crevice that he sat in into the sunlight and started giving him um, extra oxygen. They gave him enough, just enough, that he came to. And the only thing he managed to say was, my name is David Sharp, and I am with Asian Trekking. He still wasn't moving and he just about muttered that sentence. The Sherpas was running out of energy and it took 25 minutes just to move the man four feet. They realized the precarious situation that they were in and he was in and just where they stood on that mountain itself was extremely treacherous and they had to push him back into his little cave beside Green Boots and leave him. Nobody had a clue who David Sharp was until the crater died and Asian Tregan refused to take anything to do with his belongings at camp. So one of the larger groups of the team that tried to help him that night um, went through his belongings, the dead man's belongings, to send back home to his family. The teams were heavily criticised by the press for not doing more. 
uh, considering the very next night another man was rescued from the mountain. But critically, he could talk and walk. Now, he wasn't of sound mind. Um, cerebral edema had kicked in and he was away with the fairies, but he could move. He also wasn't as high up the mountain. The night was not as cold as it was with uh, David Sharp. And it took 15 Sherpas hours just to get him down from where he was stuck. So that gives you a rough idea of just how difficult a rescue mission is when you're on Everest. So Green Boots Cave is now, as far as I'm concerned, uh, Green Boots and David Sharp's cave as he remains there forever fused to the mountain for all of the climbers to go past every season. Everest could nearly be described as the world's largest tombstone because people die on her every season with uh, David Sharp being one of 11 that died that year on her. So there you go. Join me in my next video and I will see you soon. Thank you.